The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. You do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son in the into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, fill us, fill us with your powerful spirit, that spirit that changes us and transforms us and continually makes us new. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each person's heart who is gathered here be holy and acceptable in your eyes our Savior, our Lord, and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was uh, serving my year of internship in the Fort Worth, Texas area, and Trinity Sunday approached, my supervisor told me that I would be preaching on that day. He said he always had his interns preach on Trinity Sunday. The reason? Well, it is not the most popular festival Sunday for preachers, a majority of whom dread this Sunday, because the Trinity is all about church doctrine. Other festival Sundays during the church year celebrate events. Throughout the church year, we focus on the many events that took place in the life of Christ. But on Trinity Sunday, we celebrate a church doctrine, one that is notoriously hard to understand. The doctrine of the Trinity itself cannot be found explicitly in Scripture. You can look hard as you might, but you will not find it 
explicitly noted in scripture. Yet, it is scriptural to its core. It is the result of approximately 250 years of the early church reflecting on scripture and on its experience of God's self-revelation as those encounters are recorded in scripture. I love the way Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber talks about the shaping of this doctrine. And she describes something about the doctrine first. She writes, God is three persons and one being. God is one and yet three. The Father is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father or the Son. But the Father, Son, and Spirit all are God, and God is one. So to review, one plus one plus one equals one. That's simple enough. It's no wonder that so many of the early church councils were called to try and make sense of the Trinitarian doctrine. The church took its time coming up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Much ink and much blood has been spilled on this matter but it's hard to see what there is to actually celebrate on this Church Doctrine Sunday. Where's the good news in that? God as bad math? <laughs> the doctrine of the Trinity is a human attempt to explain who God is, who the Christian Church has understood God to be on the basis of Scripture. And it is the result of the church's continuing experience of God over us, of God with us, and of God in us. We talk so much about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we need to remember that they are three portions of the one reality we call God. And in today's Old Testament reading, I love this reading. It is so cool. Isaiah gives us this wonderful, big-picture understanding of God. Isaiah is in the temple, and in a vision, he has get, been given a big-picture experience in which he catches but a glimpse of the grandness and the greatness of God. He catches but a glimpse of the hem of God's robe. And even that is so imbued with God's holiness that Isaiah must turn his eyes away and say, woe is me. One of the many things being communicated in this passage is that God is holy. God is completely other and set apart. That is what holy means. God within God's self is so separate from anything and everything else in existence, so different that we simply have no reference for God. No analogy will completely do. Theologians know that every metaphor for God finally breaks down. God is like, but not like. Nothing in creation is comparable to God. So wholly other is God that even the seraphs, those heavenly beings that guard God's throne, shield their eyes and their wings as they cry out their eternal hymn of praise, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. And by the way, that hymn as expressed in the Isaiah passage that we read today is where we get the holy, holy, holy we sing during the celebration of the Eucharist. Just take time to think about that. We are singing the hymn the seraphs sing that Isaiah sees in this passage when he gets a glimpse of the vastness of God. He sees only the hem of God's garment, and they are singing this. We sing that as we get ready to come to take communion. In Isaiah's vision, the seraphs sing their song, and it reveals something more about God than simply God's holiness. 
as holy and set apart as God is, not only is heaven filled with God's glory, earth is also filled with God's glory, filled with God's presence. And here is the divine contradiction. God, who is one, who is beyond and unlike anything else in the created order, that nothing can be compared to God, is nonetheless personal, fully present, and at work in this world, revealing God's self to the world. The Bible reveals this God coming to us in three distinct ways, as three distinct co-equals, over, with, and in us. Yet these three are one. God is over us as our source, our creator, our protector, the one above and beyond who governs justly throughout all creation, the divine parent, Jesus called Father, beginning and preserving all things. But this one God is also a loving Savior, revealed as a Son who is reconciling, liberating, saving, healing and redeeming so that we might live in communion with God. And this God also renews, transforms, empowers, and sustains everything within creation and remains eternally present to us as the Spirit. All of this is the work of the one God who is indivisible in being, purpose and work. God is one. God the Father, or God the Mother, as some name God, is a God beyond all gender, male or female. Remember, nothing in the created order is suitable for defining God and capturing God's essence, save what God gives us. We call the first person of the Trinity Father, or mother, because this is the parent of the Son and the source of the Spirit, the source of all that is. We call the second person of the Godhead Son because he comes from the Father, was sent by God as God's incarnation to reveal God to us, to be God with us, to live out his life with and for us as one of us. The Spirit of God is the wind of God Jesus spoke of in today's Gospel reading. The Spirit or wind blows where it will, and the Spirit's work is to give new birth, to transform, renew, sustain, and make us children of God. The Spirit is the lifeline through whom the risen Son is present to us in life. It is the Spirit's work to make bread and wine into Jesus' body and blood for us and to use it as the means of drawing us into Christ's risen presence so that we can feed on his very life. One might say the Holy Spirit is the wireless connection between us and the Son, and us and the Father, because they, the three in one, are hardwired together in the one essence that we call God. Parent, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct means of God being over and above us, with us and for us, and in us and among us, and three distinct relationships with one another who are nonetheless one in essence, one in will, one in purpose, and one in work. And they work in concert, the three playing their different parts, three voices forming a relational trio of grace-filled melodies that harmonize into one glorious sound in order to accomplish the same purpose. 
and the relationship between the three voices is like a dance of love. This relationship, in fact, is all about love, a circle of self-giving, creating, liberating, healing love that is so inclusive, it encompasses all of creation. I wish we would get that. Yes, as we look at this dance, God is not the dancer. God is the dance itself, calling us into God's love and inviting us to join the dance. This is the mystery of God we celebrate on this Trinity Sunday, the God who is the dance of love. God over and above us, God for us and with us, God in us and among us. One God, the God who created us and makes us God's own, the God who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, and the God who is the Spirit in us and among us, inviting us into this mysterious dance of love and using us to share the good news of God's love and purpose for all, for this entire world. Amen. Everything buried. <laughs>